Good morning. Some of you figure you're done inviting because you just did so. <laughs> Hopefully uh, last week you received, I uh, understand, some of these. And um, if you need more, uh, there are a few left out there in the foyer. I was just out there looking. Not a lot, but feel free to pick those up. We don't need them left over, so please pick them up and, and hand them out. Also, your truelife.org cards are great little tools also to invite people out uh, for any church service, including obviously next Sunday for Easter. Well, these gentlemen have some Bibles in their hands. If you have need of uh, a Bible this morning, we encourage you to um, just slip up your hand now and we'll put one in your hand today. If you don't have a Bible at all, please feel free to uh, take the Bible that you received this morning home with you. It is good to be back in the house of the Lord. Last Sunday, I had every intention of coming and hearing Dean Collar. I was looking forward to hearing Dean. I did pick up his DVD, and I'll, I'll be able to look at that this week. But um, yeah, I was uh, definitely under the weather, as they say. I'm not really sure why they say that, but uh, yeah, this, this flu stuff is crazy. I went to the doctors. He said, you got an acute sinusitis, inf- so sinus infection. You got an acute lung infection. You have the flu. You have a fever of 102. And other than that, you're doing great. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's, that's been the deal. It's been really weird, though. I've, I've never experienced some of the things I'm experiencing. It's, um, it's like all of a sudden my circuits are, like, messed up. And I, I told someone this week, I said, my, my teeth all feel like they're dead on the top. It was like there was no feeling. I was sure that they, like, shifted in the night. I made an appointment with my dentist. Fortunately, I didn't go because I think he would have thought I was absolutely nuts. Um, but they are coming back now. And, and the weirdest thing is, when you blow your nose, I get like a windshield washer effect in my eye. <laughs> I'm reading through the scriptures and I'm looking for a reset button. There must be one the creators created me with, you know, like you take the battery cables off your car, you put them back on, they, they you know, straighten things out. But I don't know. Well, we are in 1 Thessalonians this morning. That much I do know. We are in chapter 4 this morning, and uh, we're continuing on with our study here, looking at verses 9 through 12 this morning. And the topic of the discussion today is, how then shall we now live? Which is a huge question that all of us uh, need to stop and contemplate. But if you put yourself back in time, think of the impact of the gospel of Jesus Christ here upon these people in Thessalonica. They've placed their faith in Christ and everything has changed. Prior to this time, they were going through life, living what they would consider to be a normal life. They were living a life where they had grand aspirations and desires like you probably do as well. They had plans that were made, they had some life achievement goals, they had a bucket list as it were, and now because of placing their faith in Christ, everything's changed. Things are radically different for them. And the tension is now for them, if we have placed our faith in Jesus and we recognize that the teaching is that Jesus is coming back again, How do we live life while we're in that intermediate period of time? How do we live life between now and when Jesus comes back? And the thought of their mind was that, well, his coming is absolutely imminent. Like they're expecting Jesus to return this week, maybe the next, but certainly not too far in the distant future. And so there was a tension for them. They thought to themselves, I wonder if I can quit my job. I think I can just hang out. Maybe all of us at Thessalonica that are now Christians will have Bible studies during the day. We'll maybe hang out at Starbucks. We'll tell other people, hey, you need to get ready. Uh, Don't you know Jesus is coming back again? And so there was some questions in their mind. And some of the things that they were doing were very, very commendable. And other things were really truthfully missing the mark. Let's look to the Lord in prayer and ask God to bless our time together as we seek to understand and apply even for ourselves, how do we live in this time between now and the return of our Savior? Father, we thank you that you've given to us the answers to life in your word. Lord, help us to pay attention to the teachings of your word and help us, Father, to live in a manner among ourselves and before the world in a way that truly reflects uh, a positive relationship that we have with you. 
whereby you are our savior and you are the one who we are living for. May you bless us as we embrace your word today. In Christ's name, amen. The Apostle Paul begins by connecting two sections of Scripture here, and it all starts with verse 9. I look at verse 9 as that in-between verse. Remember two weeks ago when we were talking about the importance for morality. And the Apostle Paul would say, listen, you folks are different than the rest of the world. And those in Thessalonica were following a pathway of immorality. But he says, listen, we are called to holiness. And so now as a follower of Jesus Christ, your life is to be modeled after him alone. And because of that, you're supposed to live in a way that is stark contrast to the way in which society lives out their lives. And so he's given us a call to holiness. And then he's going to talk in this passage of scripture about the need to walk properly before the world. And in between is this verse 9 and part of verse 10 that really kind of connects these two sections. In verse 9, Paul says, but concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. He is speaking here about phileto love. He's speaking here about that love which is a brotherly love. And he says, there is absolutely no reason for me to have to write to you about brotherly love because that's one thing that you are really, really good at. Showing love for each other is something that you have down. And he points out the fact later there in verse 9, if you look at it, that you are taught, he says, by God. And he uses an interesting combination there in the original between God who is doing this teaching and he's telling us that this teaching, this didache, is, is truly something that God himself is teaching every single believer. It is not a throwback to Old Testament teachings. He's not carrying over Jesus's teaching. He is saying that it is God the Father through the Holy Spirit is implied that we are taught to love each other. In other words, it's part of this new DNA. It's part of the relationship I have with Christ. I place my faith in Christ, and the amazing thing is God himself is teaching me something. He's teaching me that it's an easy thing to love my fellow brethren in Christ. And this church was good at it. In fact, they were so good at it that other churches in the region and in the area took note at how loving they were towards each other. Paul would say in verse 10, and indeed you do so towards the brethren who are in all Macedonia. You see, they were loving Christian brothers and sisters in Christ who were not only in the church of Thessalonica, but they were in other churches. I mean, they were just gushing with love for each other. And this is that absolute love that God had placed within all believers' hearts. In fact, when we don't follow through with loving each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, we're actually living according to the flesh. We're living in opposition to what God himself is teaching us. They were commendable. What they were doing was awesome. But then Paul writes, and here's a curious part. He says, but we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. It's like telling the student who's got straight A's in school, he's got an A++++ average. Listen, I hope you can do a little better there. You guys are just doing the grandest job at loving each other. In fact, you not only love each other in your church, you love each other in the whole city, you love each other in the whole region, but there's something that's missing here. What Paul was trying to do was make a distinguishing mark, I believe, between agape love and phileto love, that is the brotherly love they were so good at. It wasn't sufficient enough for them to just love each other in the church. They would also need to love beyond the four walls of the church and have love for the world. And I see that, and it's, it's fascinating to me because I look back up there to verse 6, which is part of that whole warning against immorality, and he says that no one should take advantage of or defraud his brother. And he's speaking there of a love that we should have towards uh, other people and that word brother there, I don't even re- believe that it respond, it's a, a particular verb or, or word that uh, is pertaining only to believers. I believe it's brothers at large, people, human beings. 
He's telling us that we need to have a love for those outside of the church. Do we all understand that? You see, we need to be concerned about the world. We need to be concerned about others. We, we need to take these invitations and we need to tell people that they can come and that they can hear about Jesus. You see, the problem was that they were becoming inwardly focused over in the Old Testament. And I'm always uh, amazed at this passage of scripture, but in 2 Samuel chapter 11, we have the situation developed there. It was a very unfortunate one where you have David sinning the sin with Bathsheba. David sins that sin with Bathsheba. You may recall while he was doing that, he engineered it so that Uriah the Hittite, who was married to Bathsheba, was, while he was up in the front lines fighting, the rest of the soldiers pulled back and they left him exposed up there by himself. And ultimately it caused his death in battle. In this way, David could have what he wanted to have all along, which was another man's wife. And this is what God's prophet says to him in 2 Samuel. It happened in the spring of the year, at the time when kings go out to battle. And it's one of those situations, and he describes the whole sin issue. And it's an enormous problem. Notice in chapter 12, the Lord sent Nathan, the prophet, to David. He came to him, and he said to him, and here's the analogy. Are you you ready for this? There are two men in one city, one's rich and the other's poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and he nourished. He grew it up. It grew up together with him and with his children. This little ewe lamb was not for food, okay? Can I make that clear? This is our little ewe lamb. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup. It lay in his bosom. So when he was sitting there on his recliner watching TV at night, he had this little ewe lamb with him. He just loved his little ewe lamb. It was like a daughter, the Bible says to him. Well, this is what happened. A traveler came to the rich man's house who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who'd come to him. But he took the poor man's little ewe lamb and he prepared it for the man. You know what that means? He chopped it up, butchered it, killed it, roasted it for this wayfaring stranger coming through. And when David hears this, he goes ballistic. Verse 5. David's anger was greatly aroused against the man and he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who's done this will die. Remember, David's the king. Chop, chop. You want to chop something up? I'm going to chop something up, David says. I am really angry. And what David's going to get as a response here is is not what he intended. He was so mad. He says, I'm going to restore you know, fourfold. He'll, he's going to restore this. Fourfold for the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, you are the man. <gasps> you see, what David had done in sinning against Uriah and taking the one thing from Uriah that he had David could have had a lot of women. David had all kinds of trimmings. He was the king. He had a very, very luxurious life. But what he spied was Bathsheba, who was like that little ewe lamb who belonged to Uriah. And that's all Uriah had. And he went in and he took it for himself. You see, David had sinned against the world. I want you to think of it in light of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. You see, David needed to have compassion. He needed to have love for Uriah. If he truly had your love in his heart for Uriah, he would have never done that to that man. David sinned in that way. And verse 6 here in our chapter 4, when it talks about not defrauding a brother that is a, another human being, he says we need to be careful how we treat those who are outside the church. We need to have love for these who 
who so desperately need a relationship with God through Christ. And so David serves as an illustration, but it is Paul who will make a particular application here. Notice what Paul says. He's going to give us actually two very important exhortations. He tells us here in this passage that you also, he says in verse 11, aspire to lead a quiet life. If we're going to increase more and more with this love that God wants us to show, he says first and foremost, he says, aspire to lead a quiet life. And then the second point he's going to make in the next verse, but it's two points as they relate to themselves, that you may walk properly towards those who are outside. This is what we're supposed to be doing. He says to these Thessalonican Christians, you need to aspire, if you're going to show more love, to lead a quiet life and to walk in a manner that is non-offensive to the world in which you live. Now, I wish that we had more to the story. I wish we had the backstory to all of this and understood exactly why Paul was saying these particular things. It's almost like this letter here that if you look really close, you cannot read it. <laughs> it's almost like we have half of the story. We've got the one side of the emails, but we don't have... Uh, the, the just behind what was spoken when Timothy came to Paul and said, here's the report from Thessalonica. That's what we're missing. And because we're missing that, we don't know exactly. But let me point out this, that as Paul's next topic after this passage of Scripture relates to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, that it's most likely that if we were to understand the other side of the issue, we would understand that the Thessalonican church had become so overwhelmed by the, uh, by the whole coming of the Lord Jesus that they have quit their jobs and they're sitting around causing trouble now and eventually becoming a burden on themselves and on the city. Are you with me? See, this is the big question. What do we do? How do we live between now and then? As we look at the church today and we say, well, the church today is, is a couple thousand years in growth since the time that Christ went back up to heaven. It is true that the promises of God are not diminished. Peter would address that. In fact, Peter would tell us that a thousand days here is like a day with the Lord. So it's been a couple of days. <laughs> Jesus is saying, well, it's only, I've only been up in heaven for a couple of days. What's, what's the matter with these people? No, Jesus is coming back, and he's coming back in his own time, isn't he? He's coming back in his own time. And so you and I have that whole tension to work out as we live life. I, I need to live life as though the Lord Jesus Christ is coming at any moment. But I also need to live life in such a way that I'm not offensive to the world. Do you see the tension that's there? I talk to people, they say, well, I know that the Lord is coming soon. I could ask this morning, how many of you think that the Lord is coming soon? And there would be many of you who would raise your hands. Oh, yeah, Lord's coming soon. Let me ask you this, do you have a retirement plan? No, no, I don't have a retirement plan. Are you saving any money? No, no, Lord's coming way before that. I talk to people all the time like that. It's like, well, you know you could live 30 years after you retire. No, no, Lord's coming back way before that. For the Thessalonican Christians, they're hearing about the return of Jesus, and they're thinking to themselves, hmm, let's get ready. Now, wouldn't you love to go into the office tomorrow and hand in your resignation letter? I mean, seriously, just be, don't, 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 don't yield it on your face. You know, just be cool. But in the back of your mind, you're thinking, yeah, that'd be pretty sweet. <laughs> and the boss says to you, well, what are you going to do? <laughs> I'm just going to wait for Jesus. Are you going to be able to afford your mortgage payment? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm selling my house. Where are you going to live? Well, you know that faith community church? 
We're all selling our houses. We're going to put these little tents out there in the parking lot. And this is where we're going to live. We're going to get ready. Let me ask you a question. If we knew for sure that Jesus is coming back today at 6 o'clock tonight, how many think we should have a service here starting at 5.30? <laughs> if I did know, there would be no service. Because it would only mean that we have a ton of work to do in telling other people about Jesus. You see, that's how the thinking went. And the Apostle Paul is going to say, you really need to make it your ambition. New American Standard would say, make it your ambition to live a quiet life. Our New King James says you are to aspire to a quiet life. Literally, the word uh, to aspire or ambition was at the root of it, uh, to be fond of honor. It's a natural desire, something to be certainly ambitious for. And so that's where this word actually grew and developed. And it must have been a situation where here in this early church uh, that people were disruptive in society to some degree. What were they doing exactly? I can't answer that because I can't read that letter. But I understand that the admonition for the, from the Apostle Paul was one that was clear. He would write later on here, Timothy, first of all, I urge you, and he goes on, but notice the bold print so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. You see, this is the testimony of the Christian. This is what God wants from us as Christians. This is how he wants us to live. He wants us to live in such a way that does not create offensiveness unnecessarily in the world. So when the world looks at the Christian, they should look at someone who is walking best as they can in a Christ-like manner, and I understand that whole process of sanctification whereby we're making better strides in our sanctification and our walk with the Lord, as the years go by, we're not perfect in any way, but we are striving to be Christ-like, and so we are resisting certain sins, and we are taking a stand of holiness. That's our joy. That's our desire. But it would be possible to be offensive to the world. It would be possible to be waiting for Jesus to return and so cast a poor testimony before the world. Paul goes on here and he says, and he kind of gives us the how. He says, you need to be aspiring to lead this quiet life. And the, the word quiet there just means to be at rest. It's, it's the idea of silence after speech or, or peace after war or rest after labor. You get the idea. That's, it's just kind of, that's kind of the way it goes. He says, you, you want to be at rest. Live a quiet life. And how are you supposed to do that? First thing he says is mind your own business. <laughs> mind your own business. Talk about practical application, right? You see, these people were no doubt becoming meddlesome because they're not working. They're just hanging out. And, and there, there's nothing that, you know, they're talking about Jesus. We could do that. But how long could we do that? And how long would it be before all of a sudden there's a tension in our community because all of a sudden there's these people who are just sitting there and they're, they're telling us that Jesus is coming back and, hey, we need to get on the stick and, and we're watching them and they're, they're just becoming meddlesome. He says, not only are you to mind your own business, but second of all, he says, work with your own hands. Work with your own hands. The idea here is to, to work in a laboring form. Manual labor is actually what's in, involved here. He says there's, there's nothing wrong with the Christian working. In fact, Paul was good at showing us the example of that work, wasn't he? Paul would go into a, a town. He would try to start a church there. He would begin by obviously talking to people in the synagogue about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and oftentimes he would resort back to his tent making because he didn't want to become a financial burden to them. He wasn't afraid to, to work. He wasn't afraid to work hard. And these Christians need to go back to work. They, they needed to go back to their jobs and they needed to, to live that quiet and peaceable life. They thought to themselves, well, if Jesus is coming, can't we just sit back and, 
and wait for his coming. There was a group back in the 1830s to 1840s by the known as the Millerites. There was a, a pastor, his, uh, his teaching was epic because he had figured out Daniel chapter eight and he'd figured out by the days that uh, Jesus was coming on a particular day. And so there were lots of people who sold everything that they had and waited for the Lord's coming. He figured it all out. He, he'd done all the dates and he had it down. And when March 21st on 1844 passed without incident, it created a crisis among these people. Now what was fascinating to me about this was the fact that while the people were devastated when Jesus didn't come back on that day, the reaction of the world towards these people was incredibly hostile. In fact, it was downright violent at times. Even little children in the streets would be mocking these people. Have you got your ticket to go up? That's what they were saying. Now, the only reason they were saying it was because these people were in the faces of the other people prior to. Have you got your ticket to go up? What's the matter with you heathens? Repent of your sin. Jesus is coming on March 21st. And when he didn't come, the people started to mock back. And it created a, a, a tension that was unnecessary. It created a, an offense. And when people looked at the church, they looked at the followers of Christ, and they were offended by this. It wasn't healthy. It didn't advance and doesn't advance the kingdom of heaven. Are you with me? You see, the problem was it went on because after Jesus didn't come back, there was even violence against these individuals. There was a church, a Millerite church, burned in Ithaca, New York. There were two vandalized, Dansville, Scottsville, Lorraine, Illinois. A mob attacked a congregation with clubs and knives. There was a group in Toronto. They were tarred and feathered. Shots were fired at another Canadian group that was meeting in a private house. Both the Millerite leaders and followers were left generally bewildered and disillusioned. I guess they would. You see, having right doctrine and right teaching so that we're not an unnecessary offense is absolutely critical to living out our faith, is it not? When you have wrong doctrine, it begins to, to create wrong ways of living. Now, you would think that these people in this group obviously spun a couple of different cults, but What's amazing is some of them started to rethink the whole thing and they figured that maybe somehow, beyond them realizing it, we were in the seventh millennial. It's like, what? And the seventh millennium is the great Sabbath. And so they all quit their jobs again <laughs> because they believed that the save shouldn't work. And what that did was it just created more tension and more problems, you see. So don't quit your day job. Keep on being faithful. Keep on doing what God wants you to do. Because you and I are called to have a great love for the world. We should have compassion on the world like Jesus had compassion on the world. On the one hand, yes, it's in our DNA to love each other. But sometimes it's a challenge to love outside of the walls. But that's exactly what God has called us to do. And to be an offense for offense reasons alone is not absolutely not acceptable. Notice what Paul writes. He says that you may walk properly towards those who are outside. And the word here, walking properly, means to walk in good form. Walk in an honorable fashion so that there's no offense. Absolutely, Romans chapter 12 would tell us, if possible, so far as it depends upon you, be at peace with all men. Notice the last part here. He says, and that you may lack nothing. You may lack nothing. Do you realize how important it is for us to carry through and be that good testimony before the world? He tells us right here how we should do it. There have been those who early in the church, in the book of Acts, when, when 
everything had taken place, the day of Pentecost and so forth, that the people started to to started to, to, to do things communally, and that is they would sell their property, they would bring the money, and they would say, okay, and they, they, again, they looked like, you know, they were looking forward to the return of Jesus. But understand this, that socialism really doesn't work. If you go all the way back to the pilgrims, uh, you don't have to go back, you can't go back much earlier in the history of the United States, but, but in the, the 1620, 1621, 22, uh, the pilgrims tried the whole socialism route and they had everything in common. There was a commonwealth, that's why it's the commonwealth of Massachusetts, and, and they would bring all of their stuff together. Back in 16... 16- 23, there was a ship that came over from England, and they were a trading ship. They were supposed to trade goods, and they had all kinds of little trinkets on this ship. And the pilgrims looked at it and said, oh, cool. We can trade our stuff for the trinkets, and that's what they did. And then they got these trinkets, and they realized when the winter started to come, they couldn't eat them. And they thought, oh, boy, that was a bad trade. And, and seriously, they ended up becoming slaves to the Indians during that time period because people wouldn't work to put it in the commonwealth. People instead started to steal. They realized, you know, there's no sense in me working hard when I can turn around and have what I need. The problem is the commonwealth area ran out of stuff and people began to starve. And because of the cold, some of them had actually traded for food. They traded coats and they traded bed clothing. And they didn't have enough to be warm and they were cold and they died during that winter. So the next year, Governor Bradford said, we got together, we thought about all of this and we're scrapping the whole socialism (laughs) experiment. And you're going to have your particular piece of ground and you're going to go out there and you're going to farm it and you're going to get whatever it gets off of that. And if you don't get out of bed and you don't farm your own stuff, eh, you're going to have need. And so that experiment tremendously failed. Even the women were so excited about it. They said the women, even with their little children, would go out and they would plant corn and seeds and, and uh, would harvest uh, the, the crop that would come in. Totally changed everything and it actually led them to be able to survive. You see, when the world would look at socialism and the world would look at those who don't do their part, can you understand that there's a lot of times there's envy there? There's a lot of bad will. There's ill will over it. And, and well, there, there should be, I suppose. But that should never be named among the Christians. And so that's why when you come to the scriptures and you have God who assembles a a people to himself, the Israelites, he doesn't make it communal living, does he? He tells them go out and farm and work. So for us as children of God, it is so important that we work and we provide a good testimony before the world. So the world doesn't look at us and say, man, you guys are just weird for weird's sake. They can look at us and say, well, you're weird because you're following a different moral track than we are. But we don't want them to look at us and say, boy, those people are a burden to society or they're slothful. We need to go and we need to be the testimony to the world because what it does is it opens up avenues for the gospel. That's what we're looking for. We're aspiring to live that that quiet life, that life that's at rest. We're we're aspiring to live that way, but we also want to convey the truth of the gospel, and we want to do that by living honorably before the world. And so it's important for us. We keep our houses and our lawns neat so that we're not a bad testimony to our neighbors. If you live in a house and the grass is six feet high and there's bats and stuff flying around and rats running around in your backyard because you got a 10 foot high compost pile, you might not have a good reception when you say, what are you doing next Sunday? Right? You see, what we wanna be is we wanna be Christ to this world. And the love that we have for this world drives us to that. Because we look at people like God looks at people. Like we used to look at ourselves and say we are a people, we are a person of great spiritual need. And we reach out with the love of Christ to others. 
the church of Thessalonica had to wrestle with that tension of how do I live now between now and the return of Jesus and you and I are doing the same thing. We live in a way that is circumspectful before the Lord. We're careful in how we live. We want to be pleasing to the Lord. We live expectantly because we know that Jesus Christ could come back today but we also live with a testimony in mind. And so there's nothing wrong with having a retirement fund. Oh, I pray I don't need it. But I don't want to be a burden on society. You see, God has created us to bring him glory. And so we live now in a way that hopefully is pleasing to him. Oh, God, teach us how we now should live. Let's pray. As we take a moment this morning, let me just mention the fact to the truth of the matter here is that Jesus Christ came into the lives of these people in Thessalonica and he uprooted things tremendously. He changed life for them. My friends, Jesus is still doing the same thing today. He's changing life for his followers. Maybe you're here today and you're not yet a follower of his. You haven't yet placed your faith in Jesus. Maybe you have your own philosophy of how you would seek to enter into the kingdom of heaven. You haven't yet embraced the words of Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except it be through me. I pray if God is working in your heart that you would take a very close look at what Jesus Christ has done and how it all fits together. And you would be led to place your faith in Jesus. If you're here this morning and you are a follower of Christ, you've made that decision to put your faith and trust in him, you would also be quite concerned as to how you should live. So as not to be a bad testimony before the world, you're concerned about how you can live a way that reflects Christ's likeness in this world. May God continue to work in all of our hearts that we might live a way that is pleasing to him. Would you join me as we stand and have a word of prayer, please? If you have questions about faith, you have questions about life, we have our care and concern teams here at the front, and they might not be able to answer every question you ever had, but they'd love to pray for you. They'd love to do their best to open God's word and and help you. And they're here after the service. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you. For you have made salvation possible through Jesus who has come and lived that perfect life and indeed is the perfect sacrifice for our sin. Father, we recognize that that sacrifice has been made, that now it's dependent upon a person exercising their will. And we think of this verse of scripture that whosoever will may come. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Father, if there's a whosoever here this morning, May you work in their hearts if they've never placed their faith in you. That they might know the joy of being spiritually at rest in Christ. Know the joy of having sin forgiven, past, present, and future. Know the joy of eternal life and that prospect ahead. Work in our hearts and lives this week, Father. Help us as your children to live in a way that's pleasing to you. And we might be vehicles who convey the good news of Jesus in the world in which we live today. Bless us, Lord, as we go, I pray now in Christ's name. Amen.